some ways that was the worst possible lead-in because it was such a fascinating presentation. Um, on the other hand, there's a thought that I want you to hold that James uh, put there both at the beginning and at the end. Multiple temporalities all acting together. In archaeology, we deal with paradox in reference to time. Ben was talking about the individual context that we, we encounter and we're aware that while they are static as we deal with them, or intercept them, they, those are end states and they encapsulate a past dynamic or dynamics. One of the questions I want to pose today is can we resolve that kind of paradox by invoking compact concepts of multiple layered intensifying temporality and of implication, how material in one place indicate, implicates or references actions and materials elsewhere. Of course, there's a history to the discussion of temporality in archaeology. Um, chronology, sequence, succession, change, tempos of change, long defined the discipline. Then, more recently, we've had concerns with time and social agency, with uh, mnemonics and memory, with biographies, and we've gradually extended what we, what we mean by uh, the biographies. Um, we started off with people, and then we uh, went to objects, and now, of course, we, we go to a plethora, uh, picking up on what we understand from ethnography about how people uh, relate to hidden beings, non-material uh, substances. And now, most recently, perhaps, a concern with the way in which um, there are temporal implications of contacts from one place to another and reference in one place to action elsewhere. And I'll come back to that. I wanted to uh, choose somewhere that I could use as a kind of metaphor for this whole process. and. Uh, spared you Stonehenge. <laughs> but of course, if I was in, in North America, um, groans would accompany uh, this just as much as Stonehenge does today. You're not going to escape Stonehenge, by the way. That's <laughs> <talk>. um, <coughs> what we have here at Pueblo Benito is one of the uh, Chaco Canyon great houses. And there are a series of these great houses uh, in a landscape where there are subsidiary sites but the two most important kinds of structure here are uh, effectively visible here uh, at Pueblo Benito. That is square rooms and uh, circular kivas, sometimes within uh, square enclosures. And what do we understand about the rooms and uh, the uses of the kivas? Uh, the answer is practically nothing. But, of course, that has never inhibited archaeologists from interpreting or trying to uh, set them in context. What, what they do have in North America is a history of research, which we also have, but they also have uh, links with living peoples. So um, Henry Hyde and others in the late 19th century came across the, these sites and regarded them as a kind of Pompeii, and in the process uh, proceeded to dig them out. And we all know what happened at Pompeii. So. Um, not only are there multiple t uh, times evoked in a site with the complexity of, of uh, Pueblo Benito, but there are also multiple spatialities, and Ruth Van Dyke and others have explored the relationship between uh, the, the form of the canyon, the <laughs> form of the architecture, uh, the variety in the architecture, uh, and so on. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that now. Okay, so this is our our basic archaeological understanding, uh, if you like, of uh, Pueblo Benito starts around 800 and uh, the, the dark blue uh, crescent represents the earliest structures. And we're extremely good at this as archaeologists, aren't we, of, of unpicking um, sequences, structural sequences. It's, it's basically one of the key things that we do. But we're getting better, I think, at contextualizing this in terms of different agencies, in terms of um, the assemblage, in the sense of assembly and assemblies of material within contrasting temporal frames. So not just thinking about what is the kind of global 
development of a site like this, but what are the intricacies of um, sequence and reference? And one of the great things about sites like, like uh, Pueblo Benito is that they are three-dimensional. Unfortunately, the, the three-dimensionality was collapsed and elided through the decay of the upper floors. But what we can understand about this is that there is uh, access control uh, sequences of movement that are um, embodied within the, within the architecture. And um, what the archaeologists have, have understood from um, some of the really good records from the 19th century works, we'll have a look in a minute, um, that there are terminal events. Uh, related to the burial of groups of objects in different rooms. And those rooms, of course, have a functionality, or had a functionality, but this changed through time. And there are histories embodied within the whole process of sorting and resourcing. And one of the more interesting uh, things that's, that's emerged from recent revisiting of the archaeology of Pueblo Benito in particular is, a, is an understanding that materials were actually being derived from one part of the site and recycled into others and that the patterns of references drew back continually <coughs> to the oldest parts of the settlement. How was this looked at 30-40 uh, years ago? Well it was quite straightforward wasn't it? There was, a, there was an incipient phase, there was a pre-classic, there was a classic and then there was a post-classic. So the model, the story, was about uh, the overall development of Puebloan societies, uh, of, of the Chacoan as a, as a phenomenon in the uh, 11th to the 13th century. Um, basically a kind of uh, Roman Empire model of how you uh, interpret and understand the history. Because in the process, it wasn't necessary to go back and, and actually look at the material that was excavated because this was essentially noise. This was, this was uh, a matter of, of, of detail, not a matter of, of, of fundamental concern. I'll come back to that in a moment. But just in the meantime, I want to think about how this is understood uh, by the public. We've, we've had lots of discussions about today about um, how moderns, how people who are approaching these kinds of sites, and remember the sites like this are, are fundamentally touristic sites as far as the rest of the world is concerned, that is the rest of the world that's not archaeologists or Zuni Indians, and they want to see what was it like when it was at its zenith, and of course archaeologists are very keen to oblige by producing these models of what it was like. Of course, what it was like for the, the local people was very different and embodied within their ceremonies, within the rituals that have taken place over the centuries since the, the florist of this site, um, has been a kind of echo continually of some of the, oh gosh, oh yes, I will use the word magic, some of the specialness of what went on at a site like this was brought through in their, in their enactment of ritual but in their memories of things that don't even exist there anymore. Some of the most interesting work that has been done recently uh, in relation to, to Chaco, some of you will have seen um, in uh, Wendy Field Murray's and Barbara Mills article um, in uh, in the uh, relationality book, and what um, what they were trying to show was that things at these these sites, objects, particularly groups of objects, how they were effectively citations of action both within that community, but also at a distance. So one of the things that they say about caches, because they were saying that, that essentially caches are not a single thing, they're not just uh, the, the putting together of, of uh, material in the same way, in the same place. There are lots of spaces in which caches uh, are pushed 
in a site like this. So inside the kivas, there are recesses where some bundles of material are placed. In other places, as we'll see, there are, there are sort of more like dumps of material. Okay, so they say that, that the um, contents and locations of these intentionally deposited objects we regard as evidence for the varied ways in which people participated in identity communities through the massing together of objects with different biographies. In other words, they're deliberately playing on the temporal associations of the material that they're putting, that the Chacoans were putting together at Benito. And uh, a particular feature of some of the, of the uh, materials was, was uh, how specialised a lot of these collections together of material were, and yet how diverse they were. So they would be um, lots of different parts of birds, for instance, bird themed. Um, a particular feature of Bonito was uh, the, the grouping together of bear and mountain lion claws and paws. But perhaps my, my favourite is um, these uh, cylinder vessels on, on the right, because is this structured deposition? Is this refuse? I would say neither. It's more like the product of binge drinking. In this case, cacao. And it was very likely that they weren't just imbibing cacao. But I'll refer you to Carlos Castaneda for <laughs> further information on that, in that area. OK, so there are things going on here. There are different temporalities that belong to Chaco and to the Chacoan people, but they link to other people. And obviously what, what um, uh, what Wendy Field Murray and Barbara Mills were doing was that they were comparing how the grouping of objects uh, was different between the Hohokam and the uh, Chacoan, which are broadly contemporary uh, groups in, in the area. And what they were showing was that one had a lot of funerary associations in the Hohokam, and at, at Chaco, uh, there was much more concern with linkages <laughs> over uh, longer distances. And some of the caches at Benito are really interesting from this point of view because of what they evoke. They evoke uh, not just the fact that there's a long distance away, they're bringing into frame through um, exotic materials like shells, like turquoise and like parrots, colour, forests, oceans. In other words, a lot of the things that you don't see at Chaco. Okay. So, moving on. Back in 1987 to 8, I developed, uh, within the context of archaeology, the idea of, of presencing. What I want to talk about just briefly is what that involves. It involves a number of different processes that all, in, if you like, interact with one another. So there's the knowledge of interactions elsewhere, which you deliberately reference in one particular context. There is the seizure of time, the taking of time that has some depth and making it present in the now. And this compounding of temp temporalities and um, you know, what Hannah was talking about is absolutely brilliant from that point of view in relation to beads because the material is continually making reference to both past and present. So, time and transition. We're 10 years on from starting to write Neolithic history from close chronology. And we are, at, as yet, however, only beginning to reference um, and wrestle with uh, the complexities of temporality. Rhetorical question for Ben here. Uh, what is the instant here, Ben? Um, <laughs> tricky. OK. This one. Uh, Richard's already, so I've just spent the morning referencing other people's talks now and I didn't know what they were going to talk about. <laughs> anyway, so, so here we are with a, with a, with a kind of temporal model and, um, and I'm probably on safe ground because Alex has deserted the room, has she? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs>
Wonderful. Great. So, causeway enclosures, Richard, absolutely, they are um, time machines. So he's talking about it, isn't it? <laughs> so, um, and, and you can see these, these kind of repeated, spatially coexistent, successive depositional events. And I just love the way that Mark talks about this uh, back in 1997. Um, you know, look at the at the temporalities he's evoking in relation to uh, the site at Eton. He's sort of bringing uh, it all into into focus and um, you know pointing out that these are lived temporalities. They're not just abstract. Brilliant. Okay, so <coughs> for the past four years, Julian Thomas and I have been meditating on Neolithic time, practices and narrative. And we've been thinking about the kind of categories that have duration, periodicity, etc. And one of those, of course, is feasting, um, deposition related to feasting sometimes, sometimes not. Okay. <laughs> An eye on our chairperson here. Right, okay, so, oh yes, yeah, so we were going to talk about time, culture, and identity. Okay, um, well, there are some implications here, and I think, obviously, that they do move beyond our traditional, traditional agenda. Again, at risk of repeating what people have been saying, isn't it wonderful that we're all saying the same things? Renewed focus on both duration and durability. Richard's, Richard's monuments going on and on and on. And yet some of them represent the end point of very long and complex events and others of them are the events of a moment. About citation. Citation is really important because it is eliding time. So not only necessarily an evocation of past time, but something amounting to a denial of its passing. The past made in the present by reinterpretation. That's why they're digging this stuff up. That's why they're pulling them out, pulling it out of middens. Picking up on a point that Julian made, where he actually turned it, compound temporality. It's the idea that as, as the Neolithic is unfolding, not everybody's running to the same schedule. There are people doing things up in the north of Scotland, which are, according to traditional models, or would be predicting what's happening in the south. I mean, they're not. Come back to that if you like. And the fact that Richard's been making over decades now that we think that we have ownership of the histories of the past. But actually, people in the past had their own histories, had their own ways of interpreting history to each other. And finally, we need to broaden our realm and range of temporality to look at other interpretive practices um, and aspects. So tradition, yes, well that's a very long uh, lasting thing to just consider in archaeology, but translation? What do I mean by translation? Well, it's between different groups. Each time you would encounter somebody in the Neolithic from another area, you would probably have to translate their experience across to yours. <laughs> Shameless plug. We've talked a lot in this forthcoming book about time and about history. And we've reflected on it a lot. And we've talked also about narrative, how it's not just a question of multivocality. It's a question of multiple narratives. We need to free ourselves from singular narratives in archaeology and move on. Thank you.